talk about, you know, the investable opportunities in the space. Um, did you drop out of college? Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. I did. Okay, well, I advised you not to, so I'm glad you didn't listen to me. <laughs> I remember Shane saying, I'm thinking of dropping out of college, and the Irish conservative in me said, oh, no, no, don't do that. No, that's not good. Well done. Uh, (laughs) um, and I say that in the knowledge that my son is in the room and I don't think it's a good idea Uh, (laughs) so tell me a little bit about how have things so when did you found Evervault remind me and just give us a very quick storyboard of where you are now just tell us the the broad brush uh, strokes if you like of the storyboard of the business yeah, so uh, as a correction, I never actually dropped out of college. I'm still, I'm on sabbatical oh, nice. from UCD. So. Uh, so you still have a foot get, in the door. Well done. Yeah, I got a, a get business cheap and haircuts. law, I thought. Business and law, ah. yeah. Everyone thought I'd do physics or computer mm-hmm. science or something, so I tried no, to prove it wrong. But um, yeah, uh, went to college for a couple of weeks, went on sabbatical um, for the cheap haircuts and cheap burritos and stuff like that, <laughs> which I clearly don't use. Um, and uh, yeah, so started Evervault October 2019. Um, that was around the same time that you would have got the call from Sequoia doing yeah. their their diligence, which obviously yeah, was a bit paid off. It was, wasn't for us, but anyway. Yeah. Um, so we had initially raised about $3.2 million led by Sequoia. Um, kind of spent a couple of years building out the initial team, launching the product and so on, uh, before eventually raising a Series A um, of 16 and a bit million dollars from uh, Sequoia as well as a few others like Index Ventures. Um, so today we're uh, about 35 people. Um, based between Dublin and London, uh, our customers, we kind of serve all sizes because we're a developer tool, but everything from you know one or two person startup building their first product to um, some of the oldest banks in America, uh, large healthcare institutions and so on in the States. Um, so mostly kind of US based customers um, and somehow we're managing to do it from Dublin mostly. Well, how do you differentiate when you're talking to a prospective buyer? How are you saying, explaining to them that your product is superior to CrowdStrikes or Datadogs or any of those kind of business? Yeah, um, I don't know if anybody's ever read Zero to One by Peter Thiel. Um, it's a great book for the foundations of business philosophy, I guess, in general. But one of the main kind of rules in that is avoid competition. Um, so to your point about there being thousands of different cybersecurity vendors, instead of just competing based on you're going into a pitch saying we have a better product because this feature we have this feature and the other competitor doesn't or whatever. Um, we basically just decided to target a different buyer. Um, so instead of these thousands of companies selling to a CISO, um, one of the challenges that we saw was that the people that are actually implementing the changes at the CISO's request are the CTO. So the engineers that are actually you know writing the code, building the product, and so on. Um, and it turns out that's just been a hugely underserved market in general um, because they hate doing the security work. You know it's logging into your Amazon web services and going through all these policies and procedures to tighten things up. Um, so we were like, why don't we take all of the work that the CISO is asking the company to do or is asking the engineers to do, but build the tooling that speaks directly to the engineers. And um, so if you look at security tooling for engineers, um, I haven't looked at the latest Harvest IT report, is that what it was called? Um, but I'd imagine that the number of vendors there is, is far, far fewer. Um, and as a result, it's been much easier for us to sell into CTOs. Uh, we also just speak their language a bit better, I think, because um, we have a very engineering-focused culture, whereas CISOs are very compliance-driven. A lot of them have kind of legal backgrounds, and uh, it's just a very different mindset, although they're solving the same problems. When you talk about a business, it's vulnerabilities, um, and every business has vulnerabilities. Uh, what do you see as the greatest vulnerability in a business and its data? Because if you run a butcher, you have a pile of data. I was in my pharmacist recently, and um, she was doing a big clear out of the database, which is a very old pharmacy. And she said, guess how many emails are on our system? And I said, 50,000. She goes, no higher. And I said, 100,000. She goes, no way more. And I said, 500,000? She goes, more. I said, no, no, that's not possible. How, what, have you taken the email of everybody in the country? She goes, no, we're just around since time began. And da, 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 da. And I realized my local pharmacy has the, collected this ab- absolute abyss of collect uh, of data and people's contact details and i realized that i could actually talk her into giving me that database and i thought about it so why are the <laughs> so uh what is the greatest vulnerability in a business because they exist everywhere yeah so um we serve companies that are very kind of technically minded they've kind of got all the most if or the kind of the table stake stuff squared off and um, but the reality is about 90 percent of businesses or i made that number up but a lot of businesses haven't solved these. And they're all kind of people problems, which is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what way you're looking at it. Um, but it's kind of like three things, really. 
Um, the first is phishing. Um, so people here probably get emails all the time from what looks like Google or what looks like um, you know, Salesforce or whatever saying um, you log in and, uh, and whatever else. Mine are a lot more modest, the toll bridge. <laughs> yeah. a click here, you didn't pay your toll bridge, but anyway, sorry. Yeah, and they, they all ask for the same data. You know, you, you type in your email address, you type in your password, and you don't think about it. Um, so just really good uh, education and training for employees within a company um, solves a huge amount of issues there. There's a lot of kind of red flags that you look for, like is it actually from a domain name, and you know, is it TLS encrypted, and so on. Um, so that's number one. Number two is social engineering. Um, it's just training people to know that if they get a phone call from someone claiming to be the bank manager or uh, you know, a financial advisor or something like that, um, that they just don't give information out over the phone. Because the vast majority of data breaches and almost all data breaches in very small businesses happen this way. Uh, and then the third is if you're a company that builds software or um, has a lot of kind of third party partners, just make sure you do due diligence on them. Because the moment you start using a third party tool, you're handing over not only do you have all the data, you're handing over all the sensitive data to them. So just making sure that they have decent security compliance certifications and so on. Not that compliance is evidence of security, but just do your due diligence on any third party vendors. And those three, um, you know, unless nation states are after you or mm -hmm. whatever, then you should be fine.